So it's Thursday evening, and I know you all know that, but I just wanted to start with the realization that um, you all came here tonight after probably a long day of work, with whatever mode you left when you came, in order to listen to and talk about circles and loops and how to make them work better, or how to take away the barriers for that. And um, whatever, um, at whatever level of um, uh, Activity you are at the industry of economy, or if you're just curious about it, I think it's true dedication that you're here at this time. So, first of all, thank you very much, and um, a compliment to all of you. Um, so, I'm Nadia Lopez, I'm the Transport and Environment Counselor at the Netherlands Embassy. And on behalf of the Embassy, but also on behalf of our partners of the Green Alliance, I really want to extend very warm welcome to you all here tonight. Um, to start with, I just want to go through a couple of safety uh, uh, issues uh, which are going to keep in mind. And that is that if the firebox do go off, uh, it's not that, it's genuine. So please uh, use uh, the nearest exit uh, you can see and do not use the lifts. Um, the fire assembly point is at the rear of the Royal Courts of Justice at Harry Street near the Red Temple. Um, they go back about uh, back to the uh, program of the evening. I also would like to briefly take the opportunity uh, to also uh, extend uh, our, our sincere uh, gratitude to our co-partners of the Green Alliance and the Museum of but also on keeping this dialogue certainly can be going because we are uh, very much. Um, uh, we very much believe that this is definitely the main way to reach our net zero ambitions. Um, as we navigate through the next one and a half hours, we have a, a lovely panel uh, with some um, very interesting speakers. I'm sure it will be a lengthy discussion that will be moderated by the week. And but before I hand it over, I would like to introduce, introduce the Director General uh, for the Environment and Intersectional Affairs of the Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management in the Netherlands. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. She took my speech, so, <laughs> so I had to run back. Also, from my side, very much welcome to all of you. It's great to see all of you here and talking about circular economy and circular finance. In the Netherlands, it's, it's a very high up political chain. And not just on political agenda, also on the agenda of companies that are really working and doing a lot of certain economy. So, first of all, I, do, I also would like to thank uh, Green Alliance and also the Dutch Embassy for organizing the, uh, the event. It's really great to be here and to see that there's such a, uh, a wide range of participants from both the public and private sector. I think the main reason that most of us are here is that we are all concerned about the current state of our plans. If we do not massively improve and reduce our research use, resource use, it will be impossible to limit global warming to the level of increase in Paris and meet our targets for reducing biodiversity loss and pollution as well. You are probably familiar with the concept of the ocean day. In the Netherlands in 2023, this day was already on the 12th of April. And if everyone on the earth lived like the Netherlands, 3.6 Earths would be needed every year. And worldwide Earth Ocean Day fell on the 2nd of August. It is clear we cannot continue our consumption of natural resources with all accompanying in environmental costs at the current pace. Reinforcing the link between climate change and circularity is essential for reaching our targets, especially since at least half our emissions are linked to the use of raw materials, strongly decreasing our use of new materials in that form. By the way, smart and efficient use of our products and materials is not only necessary to reduce global emissions directly, but also to be able to scale up the use of green technologies such as electric vehicles and wind turbines, for which certain critical minerals are essential. And there is a reason why I mentioned wind turbines 
and the electric uh, vehicles in particular. These are innovations whose future prospects did not look at right and reasonably. Partly because of concerns about the human and societal impact of these developments, which should be taken very seriously, and at the same time because of the lack of investments. But look at where we are now. Investment in clean energy, including wind turbines and electric vehicles, is finally creating momentum. Unfortunately, we are not there yet. And this brings me to the topic of today's discussion, certain finance. Businesses have a key role to bring innovations to the market, aiming for a fundamental change from the linear economy to a circular one. But they cannot do this on their own. They need collaboration with other companies in value They need the right regulatory framework from governments. And they need favorable conditions on the financial markets as well. At the moment, in many cases, Circular businesses find it hard to compete in a linear market, and they sell their success story to the wider public, leading to a lack of inspiring examples for other entrepreneurs. The financial sector plays a pivotal role in this and can be a catalyst in accelerating the circular transition. My ministry has had a lot of discussions with private, private financiers in the Netherlands under the umbrella of a sustainable finance platform. This resulted in a common roadmap published in 2022, in which the financial sector lists the most important actions which need to be taken jointly in order to transform financing circular business cases from a niche to regular practice. The Dutch financial sector acknowledged that it should be able to enable uh, circular projects and programs much more because there are a lot of financial risks in the existing linear economy, from disruptions because of climate change, biodiversity loss, pollution, and because of an unstable supply of critical materials. I would like to highlight some key issues which are addressed in this roadmap and require further retention of public and private financiers to unlock the potential of the circular innovations and business models. First, there is a lack of common definition of circularity, a lack of common methodology on measuring circularity, and a lack of data from the industry to assess circular projects and programs in a proper and consistent way. Second, the existing value and investment practice are built around the linear economy. For the short term, special funds would be needed to help circular innovations to scale up. And third, financial institutions often are reluctant to provide funding because their risk models perceive circular business models to be too risky, while linear risks, such as supply chain disruptions, are not taken into account in their systems. Here, in London, we are in the center of the financial world. You have uh, you all can have major impact in the way the worldwide financial system will be just to become resilient to the benefit crisis we face. The main question today is how we solve the issues and just address together. If we make financing circular businesses our priority, and if you dare to look critically at risk assessment models, it will be easier for circular businesses to succeed in raising the financial needs needed to start or scale the company. And with that, contribute to a sustainable, climate resilient economy. Full commitment of both public and private sector is key to circular transition, especially given the fact that we are not on track to achieve our climate ambitions. Cross-border challenges need cross-border solutions. Therefore, I am delighted to have such a diverse panel today with both British and Dutch participants who can share their different perspectives, experiences, ideas, and ambitions. I sincerely hope that this evening we can take a small but significant step towards solving these challenges. Because in the end, how we invest our pounds, euros, and dollars now will determine what our path will look like in the future. Let's make the circular economy a reality. Thank you all.
Thank you very much, Asha. It's really inspiring to hear from a government that takes the commitment to the circular economy seriously. And thanks very much to, to the Dutch Embassy for jointly sponsoring this event with us. And thank you all for coming out to hear from this amazing panel about how we can change the situation. Um, just as a, as a brief introduction to Green Alliance and our work on the circular economy, I, I think it's probably fair to say that as a Westminster-focused think tank, we are quite often frustrated that the commitment to the circular economy from the UK government rarely goes beyond the rhetorical. And the actual policies that are needed to, to follow through and actually bring about the situation where we're not using so many resources, where we're not having a, a, an Earth of Bubba Day in the UK is actually in May, um, but I think our, our material footprint is considerably larger than the Earth of Day, and we're going to be putting out a publication on that soon, so do look out for that. Um, but tonight I want to talk a little bit, just at the start, about the report that my colleagues Heather and Jasmine put out, which some of you have managed to grab a copy of at the front at the start. I hear that they were going like hotcakes, and they may have run out. So if you didn't manage to get one, it is on our website. Uh, it's called Profit Without Loss, and it sets out for us the, the economic reason why we should actually be following through with our rhetorical commitment to the circular economy and making it a reality at a macroeconomic, a business, and a customer level. Um, the evidence clearly shows that resource efficiency can drive growth for, for the wider economy, so there's one reason that we should be doing it. But it also, as Africa was saying, can, can really improve the resilience of supply chain. And that's particularly important for a country like the UK that is actually resource poor and that when it comes to critical raw materials and other materials doesn't actually have that many. So we need to be making much better use of the ones that we have. Um, but also at a business level, businesses can make money out of the circular economy. And, and I'm delighted to be joined by one who has. Uh, tonight, and, and, and a venture studio that, that can tell us why others do so as well. Um, but it's not, it's definitely not the norm, and it's not always the case that they can get off the ground structural problems that they're in and be ingrained in the new system. Um, but also, it, it is, in some instances, not always, which is again something that we need to change. It can save customers money, which is something that is really important in a time where we're facing a cost of living crisis. And so, what we need to do is to figure out how we can move barriers that are preventing this mass shift that we need to see, um, and to get the policy in place, but also the, the really crucial investment um, to, to drive the change we need to see. And I, I am delighted to be joined by some really, really stellar speakers today, um, as I've already said. And I'm going to, to start, I'm going to introduce each of them one by one um, and ask them to, to set up their five minutes stall. Hopefully, we can keep roughly to time. Uh, don't have a, a good chance to get the audience ask questions. There's so many interested parties in the room. Um, but first of all, I'm going to hand over to Anya Zestervold, who is Deputy Director in Industrial Decarbonization and Emissions Training in the Department of Energy Security and Net Zero. And her remit resource efficiency. And it's, it's really great that the, the JustNet team is, is out of course today and also taking those really seriously. Obviously, Anya is a civil servant, so we appreciate there are limits to push. Day, um, but hopefully, not least with a, an election potentially coming up later this year and a potential change of But that being said, we really want to hear what she has to say about the UK government's perspective on resource and the circular economy uh, and how we can unlock the barriers. Yes. So, so uh, thank you very much for, for inviting me and thank you for our Dutch colleagues who we know are pioneering in the circular economy. We have uh, looked at uh, the documents and your policies and they are well ahead, I would say. Uh, uh, but from the UK perspective, we do agree with, uh, with uh, the Dutch colleagues that resource efficiency is a, a player an important role in the decarbonisation of the economy. We have published uh, a UK net zero strategy. We have published a UK, a UK uh, industrial decarbonisation strategy as well. And in both of those strategies, there are, uh, uh, the resource efficiency is a big contributor to the carbon budget targets, especially over the next 10 years or so. So there is no uh, discussion about the importance of this topic. Our economy. 
Where, where, it's, where it's much more difficult is to drive the speed and scale of the transition that we need to develop uh, over this time frame, which is not uh, very, very long. Uh, for, as I said, for us, it's essentially the next 10 years that we need, we need to do in push. What we have in place at the moment is targets for reducing waste and uh, encourage recycling. We have a 25-year environment plan. We have targets for plastics. Uh, this is done by our colleagues in DEFRA. So on, on that front, we have done quite a lot. On the, uh, uh, it's not enough, but it's, there is a lot of activities there. What we have done as well is to encourage investment uh, through collaboration with the UK science and innovation base. So we are encouraging public-private collaboration to develop some of these circularity projects. Uh, the science innovation base in the UK is very dynamic, uh, very high-performing. And we have, for instance, a national interdisciplinary circular economy program. We have the Transformation Foundation Industries Challenge Fund with Innovate UK working with businesses. And so those are things that we have put in place over the last few years. But of course, this transition is going to be costly, very costly. And uh, we need to find other ways to advance, uh, to support companies who want to invest. We have, uh, in circular project, we have a green uh, financing strategy that we published last year. And it set up a framework and the ambition for the UK to become a net zero aligned financial centre. So this is uh, the ambition for, for the UK financial sector. And we are considering at the moment a green taxonomy to define what is a sustainable investment to help investors make better choice, more informed choice. But we have still big barriers that remain that prevent, we think, investors from making these informed decisions. For instance, one challenge is that the experience of resource efficiency innovations is limited. Often there is no proof of concept. And all this means that for investors, the risks are perceived are very high. And I think uh, Dutch colleagues also have come to this diagnostic. The second one is that uh, the circular projects tend to pay off in the long term. Uh, and in the long run, it makes it very difficult at this point in time for investors to assess what are the potential return on the investment. That's a second problem. And uh, another big challenge that has been mentioned is that what gets measured uh, gets managed. And if we, uh, if you don't have standardized data, it's very difficult to attract investors. This is quite complicated because we need recognized taxonomies for circular financing. We need an established set of definitions and indicators, and we need also consistent reporting of circularity investment portfolios. And uh, this, this thing is going to be very difficult uh, because we are still in the, in the foothill of trying to see what kind of data, standardized data, we, we can produce and we need. So I think, uh, uh, to conclude, uh, we believe that the circular economy is an opportunity for investors and financial institutions, not only for social and environmental reasons, but simply for investment reasons, and also for business performance reasons. And it is uh, uh, in this, with this approach that we are looking at the problem uh, in the UK, uh, we are at the beginning of this transformation, and uh, uh, we are about, uh, with our minister, Mr. Kahneman, we are about to uh, start engaging with the industry for, uh, to assess better where are the opportunities for innovation and investment in the circular economy in the UK, that suits the UK, and what are the barriers they face in terms of access finance. 
Thank, thank you very much. Uh, it's really great to, to hear that you think of the perspective and already there's some common themes that are emerging about frustrations and lack of standardized data. Um, and the need to hear from businesses that have been successful. And I'm delighted that the next person I can introduce uh, is Charlotte Morning, who is the CEO of The Little Loop. Uh, she's a great British sustainability entrepreneur of the year 2022 uh, and runs the circular coding platform, The Little Loop. And we're delighted that she's here to tell us about her experience of setting up a circular business and the reasons that you've done so and the challenges. Please go ahead. Challenges are many. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Luke. Um, yes, as, as you said, I am the CEO of The Little Loop. We are a children's rental and resale platform. Until about six months ago, we were just a, re a rental platform. And I'll explain why we're pivoting. Um, well, challenge. Um, you also said that we are successful in making money. Well, <laughs> we turn over money, but we're not profitable. And I don't think there are many businesses in the circular economy which are yet. And there are significant challenges to getting there, but we need to overcome those. Um, a little bit about my story. We set up, I set up the business in 2019, towards the end of 2019, and we launched it in 2020, in April, uh, which some of you may remember was when the first coronavirus lockdown <laughs> struck. Um, so we were set up the challenge from the offset, but um, we had a very positive first couple of years, lots of interest and enthusiasm. Everyone that we spoke to about renting children's clothing was hugely enthusiastic, it makes so much sense. Children grow so quickly, why would you buy clothes for children when you know that that resource is going to uh, not be needed before it's exhausted. Um, we were successful in appearing on Dragon's Den, I say we, it was me, um, on Dragon's Den in 2021. Um, again, to great acclaim, we had four investment offers, we took two of the investments and ostensibly everything's been fantastic. But the reality is that a consumer market isn't ready yet. The reality is that investment is incredibly hard to come by and that in order to bring those two things together, in order to turn a consumer market into a market which is ready for the circular economy, needs investment. We can't jump on Amazon and use the extremely cost-effective means of marketing in order to sell what we offer. We have to go the hard route and we have to educate the consumer, which means that it's hard to grow rapidly and it's hard to grow organically. Um, so, this is sound awfully negative, <laughs> but I'm trying to be realistic. Um, consumers, consumer appetite is growing, absolutely it's growing, and the younger generation which is coming through is far more savvy and far more aware of the, of the circular economy. There's far more renting taking place in the generation, of, in people in their 20s. We're selling into people in their 30s because we're selling into parents. So we are um, slightly uh, facing a kind of slight, slightly higher uphill battle, but as I say, the market's not quite there yet. Um, in order to make it work, we have to make it incredibly easy for the customer. We have to um, make it very cost effective for the customer. And one of the biggest challenges we have is we therefore have to compete with the incumbents. And those incumbents are cheap high street brands who are churning out products which are not circular and can never be circular. The quality is not there, the price point is too low, we can't even resell them. Um, and until the externalities of those businesses are accounted for, until they have to account for the environmental damage that they produce, it's very difficult for us to compete with them on a cost basis. Um, one of the positive things is there's huge brand appetite. So we are a tech platform, we partner with clothing brands, we enable them to rent and to resell their clothing, and we share our revenue with them. So we're actually not just a B2C business, we're a B2B to C business, and the brands have been fantastic. There was huge enthusiasm for clothing brands, particularly so we're in that space, to, to become more circular, and it's hugely encouraging. They are doing it themselves, they're partnering small businesses like ours, which is also fantastic for us. It does put the pressure on small businesses like ours, but we've had fantastic support from them. John Lewis is one of the biggest brands who've supported us, and they have been incredibly um, forward-thinking in what they do. Um, so we're getting there with consumers, we've got there with brands, but we still need investment. And that really is the kind of, I suppose, the, the key message from today. I went out to raise a funding round a year ago, spoke to around about 50 different investment houses and private investors, was told that we had the most impressive circular economy business that they had come across. We have technology, we have consumer interest, they liked me, which is a key part of, of investing, investing in a founder, 
But ultimately, when it came down to it, they couldn't quite stomach the risk. And what we were told was, right now, they're sitting by and waiting to see who survives, which is incredibly difficult. Because ultimately, and I think this comes down to what's already been mentioned, there are very few frameworks by which to measure circular economy businesses. So a lot of the investment businesses are sitting there saying, well, we'll just see which ones work, and, and we'll invest in those. But unfortunately, a lot of them are going to fail because there is no investment to enable them to survive. So it, it, is a, it is a dark picture, actually, at the moment. It's not, a, it's not a very encouraging one. What we have had is investment from the UK government. We've had two Innovate UK grants, which has been fantastic, and that's what's got us to where we've got to. So there is, there is support there. Um, but the businesses which are surviving, which are hanging on, are those who were lucky enough to get some funding a couple of years ago when there was a lot more money flying around, um, and the ones who are self-funded to now. And I think we're about to hit a bit of a crisis where we see a lot of businesses around about the same size as ours who need to go out and raise around about a million pounds in order to continue to invest in funding and are going to fail to do so. And when we talk about speed and the speed of the transition, it's businesses like ours who are driving that transition. And if we can't get funding and we fail, we have to start from scratch. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 isn't, it, it isn't the most positive picture, but it's the reality of it. And I think it's important that we talk about that and we try to bring out the, the realities behind that. Thank you. Thank you. You've clearly got a lot of support in the room, and I've sat here next to someone who has studied a uh, circular venture studio, so um, I'll leave you to discuss things afterwards. But um, it's, a, it's probably a good time to, to bring in David, uh, following on from, from those observations. David has, has many hats, but for the purposes of today's conversation, the most important two are probably that he's Vice President of the Circular Economy Institute, and he's also a co-founder of Estar Ventures, which is a venture studio specifically aimed at scaling up circular solutions. Um, so David, we're really glad that you could join us, and please, can you tell us about your experience of investing in circular businesses why have you done it now, and how can it be scaled up? Thank you, Vivian. Uh, thank you to Brewhouse and uh, the Dutch Hellman for hosting us. It's a brilliant venue. Um, I was hoping this was going to be a really cheery session. I'm, I'm going to disappoint you. It's not. Um, no, so, a little bit about venture Studios, for those of you who don't know. Um, essentially, uh, Etsor is a venture studio that is investing in extractive technologies and solutions and trying to find new materials. So a venture studio identifies a problem, identifies a solution, and then tries to grow that with the right expertise, the right team, and the right finances. And the plan is to accelerate that in such a way that it can get to market relatively quickly. For those of you who know TRLs, we tend to play in the risky area, which is TRL 0 to 4, which is the ideation and getting to pilots and the lab stage. Um, and that's where actually the UK has got a huge amount of really innovative academics, graduates, um, individuals that are very, very minded to innovation. And that's real positive. And in some cases, we have too many. But the point of getting from zero to four up to the TRLs of five, six, seven, eight, and nine is a huge chasm. We're seeing companies that have spent seven or eight years raising finance, raising finance, raising finance, getting to a point they're now at a series A and they're looking at 10 million pounds and they've got people going, yeah, okay. Nice, nice, interesting, but um, the risk, the risk, the risk, the risk. And I think this is very much where we are in the UK at the moment. And partly that is down to narrative, partly that's down to a lack of clear strategic governmental steer. We haven't got the right narrative to say that actually circularity is a way of actually enabling us to achieve some of the net zero targets. It might say it in vague ways, we need a significantly clear statement. And that is one of the major barriers that we see at the moment. We're seeing finance houses, family offices, investments, um, all going, yeah, we really like the sacred economy, we really like this idea. We've got two of our investments. One is currently taking fish waste and turning it into a compostable uh, biofilm that can 
fossil-based um, fossil plastic. Brilliant idea. Finding uh, funding for that is really challenging. The other one is got a green extraction technology that is managing to separate um, complex fibres um, such as Kevlar down to their constituent materials and create a new fibre. That one's actually doing quite well because there's a specific industry that's going. We've identified that that is a resource challenge. And that's where we haven't got that link up as a systems thinking at the moment. We can have an uh, innovative customer and says, I've got a little problem, or I've got a little solution, sorry, um, and I'm going to create something. Without fully understanding the problem that is um, identified by somebody that's out there. So um, I think for me, in terms of the major challenges we've got at the moment, there's a lack of collaboration, partly between the innovators. There's a lack of collaboration at a governmental level, and there's a lack of collaboration amongst finances. And we need to try and bring all of that together so that we can show that circular economy is about economic development, it's about green growth, it's not just about coming up with really innovative ideas. It's about putting in place the right policies at a local and a national level. It's about getting local government to put in place procurement strategies that will focus on circularity. As an example, um, we have at Sprite Hope City Council write their circular economy action plan three years ago. They have a statement in there that says by 2030, 70% of all of their external spend will be on circular goods and services. 60% of that will be provided by local businesses. That's the sort of statement we need in there to enable businesses to be confident to go for circular solutions and for the financiers to do that. We need that as blanket policies. We need to have planning rules put in place that we're actually looking for secondary raw materials as part of our new builds. We need to have circular building practice as part of planning permissions. These are the factors that are going to enable us to give the confidence to the investors to actually then invest. Because at the moment, it's a linear system. Planning is planning, procurement is procurement. And all the while they're going through traditional methods, there isn't the demand from the major buyers, the major policy influencers, to actually give the confidence to the investors to then invest in the solutions that are required. Thank you very much. Um, okay, great. So there's more themes emerging, one of which is that um, we're not properly accounting for the risk. And I'm hoping that our next speaker might be able to touch on that and, and talk a bit more, go back to the Netherlands, um, talk, talk a bit more about the experience there. Um, so we're really glad to be joined by Guy de Savo, who's from Invest NL and is the lead on the bio-based and circular business development team there um, and has been since its start in 2020. Um, plenty to say about it, but the sort of the headline, I suppose, is that you've invested over 120 million euros in bar-based and circular businesses, which we're, we're keen to hear more about that, uh, but also about your, your approach to, to risk, the emerging uh, approach to risk. So can you, can you tell us more about the aims of the working group on the circular economy that you're involved in and, and the challenges and opportunities that you see in financing circular economy in the Netherlands? Thank you. Well, thank you, first of all, to have us to be here. Uh, it's a great uh, place, actually. And in the UK, because when I'm looking at the uh, circular economy, you may say that the, 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 the Dutch are so good at circular economy. But looking back at history, I found the most thrilling examples of circular economy in this, in this country, actually. Looking back, back at the Second World War, there was this huge scarcity of materials, as the Germans, of course, talked about the uh, old that came to the UK. Um, and government uh, intervened in, on a product level, actually. To, to do some fantastic things. Of course, needed, but still impressive, impressive, like utility furniture scheme, where um, wood was cut back to the max, but still everybody could buy something that for furniture elements. Utility clothing scheme, same for textile, or even the patterns of textile would be the same for everybody, but still everybody could have could be or something. And then the most impressive one was the British National Motor Vehicle Design, car as light as possible, um, as, with uh, as little parts as possible, uh, with shared ownership, um, with a very easy to assemble and disassemble, and reusable parts. It was pay as you go, 
Then there was a point of an earlier operator to the payment system in it, where everybody could use it. Um, it was maintained by Mac Mac first. And then, most, most interesting for this discussion, the uh, profits of the companies that we made were fixed, kept actually. Um, and there was a specific tax scheme to make it all possible. When I look at this, and this actually comes from a, from a, 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 say a doctor of research from a, a management in the Netherlands, in the University of Delft. Um, I thought, well, everything is already there, and it, it is actually in the UK. So, as Dutch, in this place, I must be very level uh, and speak to you. So, I work for Investinel, which is a, 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 an institute which was started to, four years ago by the government, Ministries of Finance and uh, Economic Affairs. Um, to support the, the big transitions in the Dutch economy or in the, in the world's economy, the, the transition to, uh, to our energy system, to a circular, to circular economy, and also to a different health system. Um, we, are, we started with just a, a small bunch of people and um, one, more than one of the euros fund uh, to invest, but also um, a team of people that, um, that takes care of uh, the, the necessary um, elements to make uh, to make success possible. So the conditions for success for circular economy in our case. Um, that was not good one. Basically, um, in this in this uh, business development, we call it agency. We work we work in between the, the finance institutions, government, and, and, and industry or business to um, to make things possible to, to create conditions and do all kinds of interventions and research to, to support uh, our colleague investors, to support, of course, the whole financial world in the Netherlands, to enable uh, investing in energy and in the circular environment. Um, in 2020, indeed, the, the Ministry of um, Infrastructure and uh, Water Management, so the, the previous boss of Africa, basically, uh, asked the banks, put the banks together, and asked them what, what would be needed to finance the circular economy. And to come to a point where in 2030 we would be 50% circular, whatever that would mean, which is a, a, a huge and an extremely ambitious idea. <coughs> at that time, certainly, was still not really clear. I mean, there, there can be a lot of things in it or not in it. We still have to invite. We, we develop while we are running. Um, the work for circular flights was, was, was uh, at that time was made um, over the last years with four major, major building blocks in it. One is Mentrix, we already talked about Mentrix, it would be really, really difficult. And many, many metric systems for circular economy available, but nothing good enough. Um, the second one is risk models, we come back to that. Um, then we look into land model deals, as we, talk, as we call it, so companies or situations where, where uh, really advanced things are happening, or we can learn from. And then we are investigating financial tools to make things happen, to make things work, to make things happen. Um, all quite difficult for us because for everybody involved in this, in this uh, operation, um, yeah, it is really not comfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, everything is not as it, uh, as it is. It, it should change, we don't know how to change. We, we see a lot of risks. But we also see, and it was quite difficult, uh, by now there is a coalition of the willing whatever happens, we will make it happen. And that is a big, big difference, and it is quite recent. And it's, it helped as we could figure out, for some cases, how it might work. And it's a bit long, perhaps, to, to talk about this now, but we can, uh, we can do a discussion perhaps on it. Um, we have also some other objectives in this investment. We have to figure out a way to get the money for the circular economy. So we are very close with the European Union, which has joined Joint initiative of the economy of the, of the European Investment Bank. That's a very small new uh, kit on the block, actually. They work together with the European Institute of Technology for their own investment uh, uh, activity uh, for a very high test of the European, European Investment Fund. Um, in the Netherlands, we have the, the, the National Growth Fund, which is a 30 billion fund that invests in basically uh, the lots of uh, sustainable companies. Or, or initiatives. And, you know, we are quite in the helping consortia that ask for, for uh, subsidies in the Netherlands and, and to improve their business case and so on. So, one of the things that we were successful on was the creation of a, what we call the bio-based circular economy, which is a um, complete circular 
business or strategy for the creation of OESs, uh, so they require these plastics, uh, from farms to uh, chemicals to plastics to recycling, uh, all included in one go. So it's a consortium that includes all companies which are involved in the sector. Um, which was really impressive to work with, as they were all very well putting together, and it, uh, that helps a lot. So while we'll passing for the for the subsidy, we worked there for over a year or two to, to create um, basically consortium to create to invent this in the industry and to understand how we make it work together. And then it starts off with us we got uh, with, with 350 million to uh, subsidies to, to support the consortium and then it's really all that in order one billion to make it happen for coming three years. It's just one example of like four people of these initiatives which were taken over the last half of years. And then the third point, that was sorry, sorry, then of course on the money side we talk about institutional investors, which I mean is still very reluctant, or kind of that's a big list of the reasons. And we just then finished the study on private equity. Uh, which also still in the very early stages of, um, of sustainability and, and solidarity, for sure. But our interest is, and um, yeah, our, our want to move, so there is, it, it starts moving, not, not, not fixed. Not still. And the last point, we did a lot of, uh, we do a lot of experiments with companies, with sectors, to figure out things, to figure out what we might with. And did some did a research which we uh, uh, issued last year on circular venture building. So we thought it would build ventures, like uh, you know, starts doing. Um, and we, we have our own accelerators that, uh, that, uh, in which we, we, uh, we help our companies to grow, uh, specifically on circularity. Um, and we see that it's really, really difficult to work together with universities to figure out what's going on. Uh, and then I think one of the most important lessons to uh, that we learned is there's no, no such thing as a circular venture, successful circular venture without a circular ecosystem. So you need to have a circular uh, value chain, otherwise you will never have a circular company that can be successful. And for that, there are some important things to change. Um, first, first of all, there's a lot of collaboration on levels which are very practical, and companies don't know, don't understand, and don't see the, the value of it. So we have to educate them on doing so to help them to get there. Um, it also comes with a, a seriously increased complexity on many levels. Practical levels and also high levels, uh, which means that it takes much longer to come to, server, to, to commercial success. So from a couple of years, it might come to 5, 10, 15 years before the whole uh, ecosystem is actually so commercially successful. Um, that means that it's uh, difficult for investors to step in because, well, venture capital we typically want to go out after five years and have a lot of money. Well, five years is not in the survey. Another thing is that there is no, no such thing anymore as a unicorn. So the idea of becoming rich very soon and so the economy is really difficult. At least as long as it's also the economy doesn't exist. Uh, so there is a bunch for venture capital and also a bunch for private capital. Um, which is a big deal. So we need new rules in the economy, new rules in the economy. And their government really needs to help. And also, we need to understand why. Thank you very much. Um, it's a really interesting perspective. And I, I want to have, a, have the chance for the audience to, to ask some questions. But before we do that, I just want to ask a few, question, a few more questions uh, about some of the themes that have been emerging, um, not least around definitions and data and about risk models um, and about reasons for investment. But I suppose I'll start in, in the UK context um, looking at the definitions of circular economy um, and how the government views it and how financial institutions have viewed it because in the when we had a green infrastructure bank it did actually have circular economy as part of its remit but almost all of the investments went to energy from waste which is a which is a real problem um, and now we do have a, a new infrastructure bank which doesn't have circular it doesn't even have circular economy as part of its remit it only has waste as part of its remit and it feels like we often get stuck in terms of definitions in in thinking of circular economy as something to do with recycling. So I'm interested to, to hear the panel's thoughts on that and how to shift that to get people to really understand 
what we're talking about and also probably why it's so important. Um, just wave at me if you want to say something. How long have you got on this topic? <laughs> uh, no, you're right, really. I think um, I, I do a lot of lectures on this professor at the University of Brighton and we speak to a lot of students there and well, the one thing I say to them, circular economy is not recycling. Recycling is an element of a circular economy, but it's the last resort. Um, and that is such a powerful statement that too few people fully understand. And I think that in terms of a lack of definition, yes, we've got multiple variances of the same definition of moving from a linear system to a circular system and whatever you care to throw around that particular aspect. What we end up with is that then being used as an excuse not to get involved in the sector economy because it's not defined, it's not proper government policy, it's not local government policy. Um, oh yeah, recycling is easy, we understand that. The public are doing brilliantly, great. We've got 40% recycling as householders. Uh, I'm doing 90% recycling in the construction sector. <coughs> Reuse maybe. Um, and we have that lack of full understanding of what circular systems, what circular business models could be applied to different sectors. And that for me is one of the major challenges that we need to start looking at the different business models and we need to start looking at the different sectors and then applying those business models to those sectors. Construction sector has got huge potential for uh, embedding circularity into it. Textile centre has sector has. The electronic sector has pretty much every sector has got the potential to build in tracking, has got the potential to build in um, secondary raw materials, natural materials, and it's got the opportunity to extract materials from the existing infrastructure, I mean in existing urban mines that are already out there. So we need to much Go, up, go much deeper into how circular is about systems thinking, life cycle thinking, extraction of existing resources, and not just pandas to the recyclers. I think it's about those hanging fruit, to be, to be honest. I think everybody knows that recycling is going to happen to every product at the end of its life, or to it's going to be attempted with every product. In this. So, if you want to invest in the circular economy and you want to know that you're going to get a lot of business ultimately, you invest in a recycling company, then you'll find. And I sat on Textiles 2030, which is um, the circular economy ambition, if you like, for the textiles industry in the UK. And far too much of the discussion in that was about recycling. Because every business who was in there, every textiles producing business in there, knew that they could recycle it at least. And they didn't have to worry about whether it was good enough quality to rent it or to resell it. They knew that if they just focused on recycling, they could say they'd done something circular and that they'd tick that box. So it's, but recycling is very much the lowest hanging fruit. It's quite easy to convince people to take part in it, and there's a lot of it going on. And so actually, it's much more easy to convince people to invest in it. Oh, there's a fantastic new recycling sorting technology. Great, we'll invest in that. But I think there's a mismatch between what people are investing in and focusing in and what's most important and critically what's going to have the biggest impact. And I think that until that piece of work is done, that we understand what is going to have the biggest impact on the long term, and there are incentives and legislation and taxation, etc., that are put in place to help us get there, people aren't going to take the risk and move away from the, the easier things to invest in and to promote. Okay, thanks. Um, I couldn't agree more with any of that, although I would point out that actually, Although they're, they're, we're still not doing that well on recycling, <laughs> even though it is the easiest thing. We're, we're, the recycling rate went down last year, and when you're talking about textiles in particular, we've got a, well, textiles coming out, so I've got it on the mind at the moment. Um, but the fibre to fibre, so closely recycling for textiles, is less than 1%, which is, it is quite difficult to see how they're going to meet their recycling commitments, let alone trying to focus on the more important things. Um, but I do want to move on quickly to, to data. I'm sure we can get stuck into some other things with the audience questions. Because um, it does feel like there's been 
uh, a recognition from almost everyone on the panel uh, and from our keynote speaker that, that there is a lack of data. We don't have the data that we need. And I hear this all the time, and that's something that Green Alliance says all the time. We've been, we've been sort of championing the idea of a National Materials Data Hub and a much better uh, reporting of things like scope three emissions from businesses. And it, it feels like there's generally quite a recognition from all corners that this is something that's important, but it hasn't happened. Um, so I want to pass, I want to hear from all the people, but I might put Agnes on the spot and see what she thinks about the data issue and, and what can be done to, to change it. It doesn't happen because it's very difficult. That's a reason. Um, and it's not only uh, for private investment. For government as well, it's very difficult to function without data because you do not know what progress you are making. You do not know where to apply the effort because as you were saying, it's across sectors, it's the entire structure of the economy, but as government, your resources are limited. So you need to apply where you get the highest gains. So in the absence of, of data, it's very difficult to sell this to the Treasury, needless to say. We have been to because we need targets, we need to see whether we are making progress. We are trying new things in terms of support. We need to know whether it works, whether we need to stop and do something else. That issue. And uh, same issue for investors, but in a different way because it's risk, it's return, etc. Uh, we have been uh, uh, also uh, uh, doing some in depth research. Uh, uh, we, are doing, we have been doing uh, uh, for 12 sectors of the economy to precisely try to see where, where are the highest gains so that we can think about how to actually uh, target interventions where we can progress faster so that uh, it's not uh, a Christmas tree effect with a little bit everywhere but it is centered to where we can get the highest gains for carbon budgets. We have published a, 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 a tranche one of this research and hopefully uh, we will publish more uh, next year. But in terms of, of data, this is also an international program. I think uh, uh, Eurostat has started to publish, to publish um, uh, a framework. Um, and I think this is uh, comparable across country data that are comparable, not little pockets of data that are not comparable everywhere, uh, is what is required. And this is a program of work, it's not going to happen uh, overnight. Uh, this is a program that uh, needs to be funded by government. Yeah, so, I mean, we, we, we have a huge resource of data, it's one of the most exciting things about what we do because we track every single item in our own country and we look at how often it's reused, we know how many days it's been used for, we know how many people have used it, we know how much money it's earned, but we don't know what to do with that data because there isn't uh, a, a centrally agreed set of data that's required. So we share it with our brands, we use it internally, but I think if, if there were the opportunity to have a, an agreed framework for the kind of data that would be valuable, then that would be incredibly helpful um, so that the businesses that have got it, lots of businesses will be storing that data. I think there are lots who probably aren't as well because it requires, we've, we've had to put a lot of technology in order to be able to do that and a lot of the businesses operating in the circular economy because there's not been a lot of investment are kind of doing on a bit of a wing and a prayer and they've hacked together a bit of Shopify and a bit of this and a bit of that and so they don't really know what their inventory is doing, they're just like does the kind of the revenue that we're bringing in cover our costs and is it kind of working um, but also if there's no imperative to collect that data then they're not going to invest the money in order to do it. So, I, I mean, I couldn't agree more that we need it, but it's just understanding what it is that we need and what, what, is, what the outcome of it, what it's going to be used for, and is it going to, to bring back value? Um, I couldn't agree more with everything that's been said so far. I, I think, as somebody that's worked with data for 20 years, uh, data is, a, is only as good as the person that's providing it to you. Um, we're currently, as the venture studio, working with one of our partners to do a life cycle analysis of a very complex vehicle down to every single nut and bolt to do a scope three assessment. And we've weighed every single part of this vehicle and have got the material and we've worked out what the functionality of the manufacturing processes of each of those materials. 
We're now getting a very, very detailed scope three analysis of this vehicle, um, and then can look at, okay, do we replace this part with another material? Because we've got the data to be able to do that. We've got the information that has come from the data. So gathering the data and then turning it into information is an absolute key element of this. But we also have to recognise that there are a lot of people out there that have got data that they don't share. And a lot of those are brands. There's a lot of information out there that should be accessible and should be used, but is not actually ever given. Um, I know on the local authority household waste site, for example, I was on the steering group that set up waste data flow back in 2003. That's a brilliant data source. That's 21 years of local authority, individual authority data down to every tonne that's ever been collected. It's an absolutely brilliant source of information, but it's on waste. It's not on the raw materials that are flowing through the system. Um, I did a piece of work with uh, Re London a couple of years ago looking at the food that was being um, consumed and used within London, trying to get import data for what food was coming into London. was a hell of a nerve. Um, there isn't that granularity that allows you to get down to a point to be able to have decision-making data tools. And this is where we have to have a much greater emphasis on looking at how we can set in place the organisations that have this data to actually share that data without commercial confidentiality being challenged. Um, but also looking at how that data can then be used to make decisions more easily because data is great but we need information. Can, can I get a one word answer from the panellists about whether they think it's down to government to compel businesses to start providing more information? Is that how we should start things off? It would be very easy to ask but a very difficult answer. So I'm not sure it would be the right way to go. But in some cases, yes, we, we might well do that. Maybe we, we did a true price comparison between different plastics, also on the bio-based plastics. Now on the bio-based side, we had quite a lot of information based on LCAs. With LCAs on the SAS side, we would be so, let's say, uh, biased uh, and with good reason. It was really difficult to compare them. Um, and it's probably the same for all, all industries. However, we tried to make a, a systemic approaches to, for example, the Today, the textile business in the Netherlands, seeing what, what the mass balance is actually with the whole industry, and I see where, where we could intervene to, in terms of circularity. Uh, uh, but it, it's a hell of a job to make it. Yes. You very much, David. Okay, I'm going to ask one more question and then I'm going to open it up to the audience. Um, I, I do want to return to the question of risk, because obviously it is incredibly important that risk is properly accounted for, and I suppose that. That's probably even harder than just getting raw data. That, that, that's, a, that's another layer of data. Um, but in terms of what you could do in, in the short term to start better evaluating risk and accounting for risks, both, both for the benefit of financial institutions, but I suppose also in the sort of macroeconomic modeling that we rely on to talk about economic benefits, which don't properly account for risks, are there any short term steps that we could take? so that risk becomes more ingrained in the economic thinking and helps build the case for, for more circular businesses. Yeah, I can comment on that. I mean, um, in the same room that we discussed about, there was this topic on, on the risk, uh, risk modeling, actually. Um, and we see that um, many of the startup scale-ups that we see come into a risk model of a bank and then immediately get stuck for a whole bunch of different reasons. So as we mostly work with startup scale-ups, uh, Good part of the, of the reasons are related to being star scaler, whether it's linear or, or circular. So, first thing is to, to differentiate those two things. Um, and, and then we look into the into a lot of research that was done in the Netherlands on specific circularity risks of small companies, also big ones, um, and brought it into a risk model. We want to, to, to rebuild actually the risk models of the banks, but that's a huge job. So, in the end, we, we with these, these same group of banks and we, uh, we decided to make a, let's say, a pre-risk model. So we built a model that just uh, published uh, last week, actually. Uh, the, the, main, the main banks in the start to, start to use it now. But one circular company comes in, 
uh, for, for, for whatever. We go through this model, we go first through the, this model we present as kind of a, a gatekeeper, and to, to filter out anything that is circular and get a special view. Uh, so they won't get stuck immediately in the regular, uh, the regular response. And we, we now start the first 10, 20 companies in the past few. That seems to work. And then we have uh, in, in this, in this say, C, there's like 25 questions which which the segment is the companies. the companies. From there we can start. David, I'm not going to take your question. I'm not going to take your response, but maybe you can fit it into a response to, to someone else's questions. You can fashion it that way. Can I get an indication of how many people have questions that they'd like to ask the panel? I have a feeling that there might be more than we can get through. So I will take three at a time, um, if I can. Um, so there, with her hand up first. Um, Heather's got a roving mic. And then um, there's a question. We'll sort of work our way back um, behind Claire and then along the row. Um, three questions at once, please. And, uh, if you can say who you are and keep your questions concise, that'd be great. Thanks, Lily. It's uh, Claire Shrewsbury from RAP. I was wondering, on the sort of thinking about investment and the money side, whether anybody would consider carbon credits in how, um, as, a, as a way to kind of bolster investment. We've done some work thinking about food waste and how food waste could be investable because it obviously reduces carbon. So, how does carbon credits play into this space? Okay, great. Nicely concise. And yes, pass it to the row behind you. There's a, someone in a suit um, who had a question there. Um, yep, you. The row behind you. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, is it me? It is you. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Terry O'Neill, Temple, um, Planning Environment. Um, very good panel. Uh, forgive me if this is a bit of a simplistic question. One of the challenges I would suggest with circular economy and quite frankly making it economic is the sheer volume of material that is available from a non-circular basis and how uh, the circular economy can quite frankly compete in your views case. Thank you. Okay, great. And I think there was a question in the row just along. Thank you. Sebastian Macassar, student. Uh, I noticed you were all mentioning risks, and um, in particular, that was one of the reasons that investors were skeptical. How would you plan to establish a proof of concept in order to reduce these kinds of risks? Okay, excellent. Three excellent and concise questions. So, panel, you can choose which one you want to, to answer, but we've got Claire's questions about carbon credits, Terry's questions about what we can do with the sheer volume of material that we are surrounded by, and Sebastian's. Uh, final question on um, proof of concept. On, on the proof of concept, um, supporting businesses to develop um, proof of concept is not new to government. We, we do it for the things. Um, for instance, we uh, support early movers um, in, uh, to, to try technology to decarbonize their production. Um, uh, and to be more energy efficient. Um, so we, are, we already do that for decarbonization. We don't do it so much at the moment for resource efficiency, but deployment, technology adoption, demonstration is something that government uh, has been doing in other fields um, uh, more uh, over recent years. So this is this, this can be done, uh, government can help you with can, your business for support but by the UK, which is uh, also to de-risk part of the investment. The problem, of course, that is typical problem of innovation is uh, the scaling up problem, and um, that's a problem that exists in, uh, for all innovative businesses. But it is probably perhaps uh, more serious for businesses and circular economy for, for the different reasons that uh, we have uh, discussed. Yeah, I mean, I would echo that. I think proof of concept is not the challenge. 
it's it's quite easy to get to proof of concept stage. It's very easy to pull together a very scrappy mineral oil product, get it out to the market, test it, understand that it's going to theoretically work. But when it comes to the risk, certainly as it's been quantified to us by venture capitalists, they, and it, you know, in very base terms, they need to see a million pounds in revenue before they'll consider investing in you. And a million pounds in revenue is not that easy to get to when you're a circular economy business, because you're having to put so much of your existing capital into innovation, into technology, into process development, that you don't have a lot of money left for marketing. And when it comes down to it, that's what it needs. It needs investment in marketing. And, and that kind of ties a little bit into the second, that, you know, how can it compete? That's, you know, that's the big challenge. Um, trying to compete against the, the, the bear moths of fashion, particularly, you know, Shein, et cetera, et cetera, is incredibly difficult to do without investment in marketing. So it's a, it's a very chicken and egg situation because you can't get Innovate UK grants to put into marketing, They're, and understandably so. <laughs> um, you have to get venture capital. Well, you can get angel investment, but there's not a lot of that around at the moment given the economic, macroeconomic climate. So you have to get venture capital funding, but you can't get that until you get to that million pounds. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's a very entrenched situation. It's very hard to, to get out of that. Um, and yeah, and it's, it's, it's difficult to compete when the businesses that are putting that material into the, into the world are able to do it at such a low cost because they're not having to account for the externalities as I mentioned earlier. It's, it's so cheap to produce cheap, crappy clothing. Um, and, and the consumer intrinsically discounts the future. So as consumers, we'll wander into a supermarket and go, oh, oh, it's so cheap, I'll just buy that thing. And they don't think about the fact that it's not going to last very long, that they're not going to get much resale value back for it because it's there, then it is cheap. And, and that's, that's, that is hard and that's somehow we need to find a way to solve that. Um, I might take all three of them very quickly. Carbon credits, very interesting. The problem with many startups is even if they did a couple of tons of carbon benefit, the income they're going to get from it is minuscule and doesn't cover any of the innovation costs. But we need to have something of that ilk that can actually reward. Um, ease of access to material is one of the biggest problems that any innovation has got, that you've got an established market with, as you just said, a very cheap way of producing stuff that people want to borrow it. And the biggest challenge for any startup is when you get a brand coming along to you and go, love it, love it, love it. Um, can you take your two meters that you can produce a day and turn that into two million meters a day, please? And that's where that scaling is so huge. And I think the proof of concept, and this is why when we set up the Venture Studio, one of the key things about Venture Studio is to have a wraparound support network for the founders, for the innovators. Because a lot of innovators come straight out of university or are, have been in the sector and have got a brilliant idea, but they don't know how to build a business. They don't understand what is required to position, to do the marketing, to get the right people in place. So, um, as a Venture Studio, we think that we can de-risk because we bring the expertise, we've got the knowledge, we've got an understanding of how to grow and run businesses. We have a lot of contacts through like books that can open doors. That actually is hugely necessary for a lot of startups. And startups are risky. Let's not be <laughs> scared about saying that. Innovation is risky. We need to have innovation to solve some of the major problems we've got at the moment. So if we de-risk too much, we don't innovate. So we have to acknowledge that there is always going to be some risk, but we have to mitigate it down as much as possible to enable the innovators to thrive, to provide the solutions that we need to change the challenges we've got for climate at the moment. Yeah, on the, on the carbon credits, uh, it's an interesting question. We, did, we wondered whether we could use carbon credits for the business cases of our portfolio companies, the Mark Sutters. But also for these big consortia on, on, on the domestic side, for example. Um, knowing that the free market of carbon credits is a free market, so it's uh, difficult to make it, to stabilize it, to make sure that there is not too much risk in the rating of these carbon credits. Um, so we started on that on the premises, we then, then found out that it was really complex for companies to step into this such a free market. So we, in the first stage, we built a roadmap for companies to make them understand what to do, how to do work, what their partners could be, and so on. We step into the market, 
And then now we are going to see where we can, can uh, facilitate or even build such market from our own view, but to make sure that for free, free market for specific areas, but those, those marketplaces are stabilized. Uh, but it is, it is quite complex and free markets. Our role is also to be discussed with it. Um, and of course, the, the other one is indeed that uh, the amount of money that you can gain from car credits so is only relatively small compared to the business. It might help or not, the uh, um, Another thing we talk about is target scale and innovation. But if we combine target scale innovation and circular, it will really complex. And if we want to go to a circular economy, and not only we should only look at startup scales because it will take way too long. We have to convert existing companies into circular companies, which may be much easier in them than uh, than to get startup scales. Much lower risks. The risks are different, but they might be lower. It does feel like a statement of hope, which is something that we haven't had much of this evening. So thank you very much, Guy. Uh, I'm going to take one more round of questions, which I think is all that we have time for. And just for equity's sake, I want to take them from the back of the other side of the room. Um, so there's three questions near the aisle. We could just work our way down the aisle. Hi, um, my name is Simon. My interest is in supply chains. Um, when we're talking about finance, we're talking about circular economy and getting more green. For me, the supply chain is always, whatever the product is, whether it's my jacket or building materials, I'm always predisposed to going straight back to the source of where all the materials are coming from. And yes, some of it comes from India, some of it comes from China, but most of it comes from Western to Central Africa. And if we're to take a full circumspect look at the supply chain in a circular economy, which should be equitable as well. Are we really taking an earnest look at the supply chains, the human rights issues, and also looking at the fact that for the first time ever, a certain number of African countries are actually saying that we're not going to sell the raw materials to Europe and the rest of the world at raw material price. We're going to start making it. We're not going to be ripped off anymore. We're going to send you the finished product because we, when we sell the raw materials at that price, we're not really allowed to progress. So for me, a circular economy, how can you actually talk a circular economy when the largest continent in the world is not really included in the mix? Okay, thank you for your question. Um, I'm going to move to the next row up. There's a hand high and high up here. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I'll stand up oh, too short. Yeah, my name is Sonny. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Brilliant presentation. So I just have two lines. So I would like to share some uh, two lines historical context, which is just very, very, very brief. A little over 30 years ago, most countries' economy was pretty much circular, at least in most African countries. So, and then came globalization. Along with uh, Bretton Woods institutions, United Nations and allies, and then they sold it to the humanity like, oh, this is going to solve a lot of problems, reduce hunger, and name it. And then now... Sorry, can... Then, very no, 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 I'm going, I'm going. One, 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 one. And then now, the same, the very same institutions are coming back with circular economy. And then my question is, how do we finance the circular economy in an extremely fragmented, multipolarized world today? Thank you. And thank you very much. We've got time for one more question. This gentleman's raising his hand very high, so can we come to him up at the front and then we'll take responses from the panelists all three. Thank you for the great, this is an amazing um, talk. And uh, I'm Aslan, I'm a technology scientist, and I'm currently working on a free universal healthcare service integrating quantum AI and DARQ technologies. Now, great question about supply chain. Um, we actually now have a solution with quantum computing. In a minute, instead of a whole year, you can do chemistry experiments. So before, we'd spend years of research, as you know, 
um, and then actually doing the research and testing it. And out of 100 chemistry experiments, only one would work to turn carbon dioxide into AMM. But with the quantum computing, and thank God to Microsoft, we can now do it for free. We can test it out. So Microsoft is zero quantum. The uh, question is now is getting the digital skills gap, getting those technologists to collaborate with the chemists. Because I know how to do the tech, but I don't understand your, all your little uh, squiggles that you do. That, <laughs> that you obviously they're amazing, but we just we can we've got the tools. We just need to now focus in quantum computing and especially in collaboration with AI, because AI everyone's like, oh, it's going like, to take over our jobs. No, there is an AI tool called Consensus where you can actually. Um, it's a, no, it's a search no, engine. I think you've made your point. It's a yeah. good question. A good, a good question about yeah. quantum computing. So, so yeah, basically, well, just just to end it there with AI. Um, it would have taken us a year to find this new research, but now I can just type it in ChatGPT, connect it with consensus, and now it gives you real two hundred mil, two hundred million academic uh, research data. So then you put it back into the AI, and that, that's how you do it. Okay. So, thank you very much. So we have. No time whatsoever to answer these very thorny questions. So I'm going to ask the, the panelists to be as concise as possible before we uh, break up and go go for a burnley did drink. I think. Um, so if you've got short responses about supply chains, about the thorny issue of globalization, and about the role of AI in improving things, please. Quantum. quantum. I'm not sure about quantum computing, but I would like to comment on materials from Africa. Um, we invested in Fairphone, which is a company that, uh, that builds uh, phones, mobile phones, uh, based on fair uh, uh, supply chain practices, and certainly well, on critical raw materials in Africa. Um, so they are more like an activist group than a company, actually. But they are running a company, and they are uh, su successfully running a company against very, very big, big companies in mobile phones. Um, and on the side, or in the middle, I don't know, they also created this association to improve uh, the, the labor relations in, in Africa. Um, now, we discussed with the mine, mines in Africa and in Australia about renting the material instead of selling this. Um, and then it becomes interesting because material will just be rented by us and still be owned by Africa. And then one will go back. Um, and that creates a totally different uh, global uh, system, actually, which is circular. In a very different way. Yeah, um, supply chain. I try not to use the word chain anymore because it's very linear. So we're using supply networks. I agree entirely that we need to look at who owns it and how it's used. And of course, raw materials, as long as they're recovered at the end of life, um, can, depending on what they are, of course, be extended for as long as possible. Um, the point about AI and chemistry and quantum computing. Is absolutely something which is necessary for circular economy moving forward. We're looking at it in terms of how we can bring different disciplines together um, AI and chemistry, um, programming skills, um, chemistry skills are absolutely fascinatingly interesting in terms of solving some of the solutions that are out there. So we need to bring those disciplines better together. I only feel I'm maybe qualified to comment on one of those things. <laughs> um, uh, on supply chains or networks, I think um, when we deal with textiles, which is not quite, I think, maybe the area that you're commenting on so much, but the thing that we are very, very hot on and very focused on is the ethics of where the products come from that we are prepared to circulate. So we actually want to work with brands who we don't believe have an ethical supply chain, are paying fair wage, and are doing their very best to make the materials as sustainable as they possibly can. There are huge issues with that. There's a lot of opacity and, and, and a lack of understanding of, of, of supply chains, but to their very best, or to our very best ability, we will only work with those companies. The nice thing about that is those companies tend to be the, the, the businesses that make products which are quality and better designed. So they tend to be the products which are more suited to a circular economy as well. In, in my naive dream of the world, we effectively make it so that businesses that don't create good quality and ethically produce sustainable clothing effectively can no longer exist because they can't participate in a circular economy. And I think that's what we need to get to. 
Well, I'm not competent to discuss global value chains. I'm sure in my department there are some people better placed than me to discuss these issues, but uh, I am competent to answer questions about uh, cross-disciplinary research, and uh, UKRI was created uh, a few years ago precisely uh, to do that. So the UK is very good at cross-disciplinary research. AI is, as you probably know, one of the uh, pet subject of our Prime Minister, so I think on that front we should be uh, progressing well. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we've gone slightly over, but I think it was worth it because there was such a, such a range of topics to discuss. And um, colleagues from the Netherlands, the government of the Netherlands, and I hope the speakers will be able to stay around for a drink, and I hope all of you will be able to stick around for, for a drink and some canapes after so we can continue this conversation. I'm not going to try to sum up, but obviously we have identified that there are lots of challenges that we need to overcome, uh, lots of actions that need to, to happen, but above all, lots of reasons that we need to get this right. So thank you very much for coming out tonight and helping us think about what we need to do in order to do so. Um, I'd like to thank again the, the Embassy the, of the Netherlands who sponsored this event uh, and co-organized it with us, and all of you for coming out on this Thursday evening to learn about the circular economy and last of all to, to the speakers who have shared some really valuable insight. Thank you very much.